All right, I know people are still coming in, but I'm gonna go ahead and get started, just being mindful of time here. Um, so welcome to Poetry for Black Lives, a reading and conversation. Um, I'm honored to be hosting this event. My name's Emily Ruth Rutter, and I'm an associate professor here at Ball State. Um, I have the honor of being a co-editor uh, with Sequoia Maynard and Darlene Anita Scott and the late Tiffany Austin on a book called Revisiting the Elegy in the Black Lives Matter Era. And that's kind of the focus of the conversation tonight. You can see our website um, on your screen. So I want to begin just by um, thanking a few folks who, who made this event possible. Um, the Honors College, this event is part of the Honors College Lecture Series, the English Department, uh, and African American Studies, who all are supporting this event. And I especially want to thank Keisha Warren Gordon, the Director of African American Studies, who is here tonight, um, and also the members of the Student Anti-Racism and Intersectionality Advisory Council. Uh, so that is Tierra Harris, Eric Fulton, Lauren Reynolds, Leandria Rainey, Sabrine Saeed, Karina Herrera, Ella Zumba, Nikasia Williams, Jordan Blythe, and Vanessa White. Uh, thanks also to Katie Didden, fabulous poet and dear friend, uh, who is helping to admit people along with Keisha Warren Gordon, and, um, and especially to Tony and Ruth Austin for their support. Um, and I hope they can join us tonight too. So I'm grateful for, for all those people. And of course, also Sequoia and Darlene, <laughs> who we will hear from. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the format for tonight. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Um, so um, I'm gonna begin by introducing Sequoia and Darlene, and I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about our volume that we co-edited together, Revisiting the Elegy in the Black Lives Matter era. Um, and see if I can actually put our website into the chat here so that you can peruse that on your own. Um, then I'm going to pay tribute to Tiffany Austin, who was uh, our co-editor and friend um, who passed away in June 2018. So we're going to spend a few minutes um, paying tribute to her. And then I'm going to pass the mic to Brittany Kendrick and Kayla Bell, um, two Ball State recent graduates, and, um, and especially, I want to say, graduates of our African American Studies program. So we're, we're so proud of them, and my heart is so full that they're here tonight, and they're going to share a poem with us. Um, and, then, and then we'll pass uh, the mic to Sequoia and then Darlene, um, and then we'll transition into a conversation so we've, we've left plenty of time for questions and, and conversation. So if you have questions that are kind of occurring along the way, feel free to just drop them in the chat. But I will also let you know um, when we're kind of opening up that Q&A period. So again, I'm really delighted to introduce our readers tonight, Darlene Anita Scott and Sequoia Maynard. Darlene is a poet and visual artist whose research explores corporeal performances of trauma and the violence of silence. Her poetry appears in journals including J Journal, Quiddity, and Baltimore Review. Her art is featured in venues including Barron, The Journal, and at the Girl Museum, a virtual museum celebrating girls and girlhood. Scott's most recent project is Breathing Lessons, a multimedia exploration of the term good girl and its application to black girls. And again, she's a co-editor of this volume revisiting the elegy in the Black Lives Matter era. Um, which is the focus of tonight, and Sequoia Maynard is, is also an editor, um, and she is an assistant professor at Spelman College. And her poetry and scholarship have been published in the Feminist Wire, Meridians, Obsidian, the Langston Hughes Review, and elsewhere. So again, I'm just going to spend a minute telling you a little bit about the background of this book. Um, I began revisiting the Elegy in the Black Lives Matter era with the poet and scholar Tiffany Austin, um, in fall 2017. And the book just came out um, in January 2020. So um, kind of a long time in the making. And the idea for the volume grew out of some conversations that I had with Tiffany. And actually, I know Brittany <laughs> will remember when Tiffany was, uh, was on campus. Um, so many of you will remember that um, that fall um, and, and in, in 2016. Um, and we, we started talking about kind of a recent outpouring of Black elegies or the poems of grief and mourning 
uh, particularly in response to um, police violence. So Tiffany and I were interested in exploring the ways in which these poems defied the conventional elegiac turn towards consolation or reconciliation. And instead, poets were using the poetic landscape as a site of resistance to state-sanctioned killings of Black men, women, and children. So when Tiffany passed, uh, Sequoia and Darlene graciously agreed to join me in forging ahead and ensuring that revisiting the elegy was also part of Tiffany's artistic legacy. Uh, this volume does a lot of different things, <laughs> um, which you know, you'll hear about tonight, but it showcases a wide range of elegiac responses to police violence, to police killings, the surveillance of Black communities, and the slow violence of socioeconomic disparities, among other forms of structural racism. Moreover, we explore the role that elegiac writing plays in both the political movements for and personal commitments to Black lives. And I want to say, too, that we focus on kind of what the elegy does um, in terms of coping and healing. So a wide range of kind of um, functions and roles that elegies play in this book. If elegy holds the promise of communion with the deceased and of puncturing the boundary, however briefly, between what was and what is, um, then I think what you'll hear tonight is that Darlene and Sequoia and the other writers that were featuring and revisiting the elegy in the Black Lives Matter era, they offer further boundary breaking potential, whereby the possibilities of a more equitable what could be take shape. Um, so I'm gonna, um, turn it over again to these poets in just a moment. But before I do that, let's just take a, a few minutes and, and pay tribute to Tiffany Austin, again, um, co-editor of this volume, Revisiting the Elegy in the Black Lives Matter Era, um, dear friend, uh, and we'll take a, a moment to pay tribute to her. I'm gonna share my screen with you, and this is a Facebook video, um, so I hope that the technology works <laughs> and just bear with me for a moment as I as I prepare this. Okay. There were no mirrors in my Nana's house. No mirrors in my Nana's house. There were no mirrors in my Nana's house. No mirrors in my Nana's house. And the beauty that I saw in everything, the beauty in everything, yeah, it was in her eyes. Oh, it was in her eyes. I'm telling you, there were no mirrors in my Nana's house. I never knew that my skin was too black, and I never knew that my nose was too black, and I never knew that my clothes didn't fit, and I never knew that what the There were no mirrors in my Nana's house. No mirrors in my Nana's house. There were no mirrors in my Nana's house. No mirrors in my Nana's house. And the beauty that I saw in everything, the beauty in everything, yeah, it was in her eyes. Oh, it was in her eyes. I'm telling you, there were no mirrors in my Nana's house. The last comment on his first conversation was, I just want them off my back. 
And to me, that's the issue. They're not going to get off your backs unless you have a different structure, right? Um, whether it's uh, reparations or not. Um, and I reminded of the Audre Lorde quotation as well, like the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And so the strategies do have to come from us. And I think that the movie, you can't tell Wakanda and the director of Wakanda to tell us how to solve it, right? But the positive aspect is, is that students who didn't think about technology in Africa being a rich resource, the Bahamas being having rich resources, now think of it that way. So that's the, the, the possibility that comes out of the movie, even though it's coming out of all the system that we know is part of the master's tool. But what have we done before, historically? We've been subversive in how we get the, the message we want across. And so that's what we have to keep on doing until we have the strategy of how we're going to dismantle the system. I never knew that my skin was too black. And I never knew that my nose was too black. And I never knew that my clothes didn't fit. And I never knew there were things that I missed. Cause of beauty in every day. Yeah, it was in her eyes. It was in her eyes. All right, so um, that's a beautiful tribute. Thanks again to, oh, sorry. Thanks again to Tony Austin for giving me permission to share that with you tonight. Um, all right, I'd like to transition to Brittany Kendrick, who um, again is a recent Ball State graduate, a poet, um, and uh, she graduated from our African American Studies program. Very proud of her. Uh, she's going to read us a poem, and I know she also has good memories of Tiffany, so I think it's a, um, a really natural transition to your work. Uh, thank you. Um, that was a beautiful um, video that we all got to watch just now. Um, I'm sorry to know that I, I hadn't known that Tiffany had passed away, so it's very sad to hear that, but I know she left a lot of great work behind her. Um, and I'm very happy to have met her when I did get to. Um, I'm going to read for you guys a poem that I made just uh, actually before I graduated this past year. Um, and Dr. Katie Didden kind of helped me put it together, at least gave me some, you know, some kudos for the um, how to, you know, go about writing it. Um, so uh, it's a poem that where you write in key. And writing in key is where you take probably two things that seem like they wouldn't go together, but you pull from the qualities of each of them um, and kind of make a beautiful mesh of poetry from it. So my poem is called How to Make Taffy Bantu Knots, and here we go. Get everything you need, sugar, butter, oils, flavor and colorings, curling custard, whipped pudding, vanilla bean cream, shea butter, almond, cocoa, take your pick olive oil, coconut, jojoba, peppermint. 3A, 3B, 4A, 4C, golden twine, jewelry rings, hookah shells, and wooden beads. Begin the process, grab your tools, access a comb for scoring, a brush for stretching, hands for pulling, hands for threshing. Score your rows six, nine, or 12, saturate the flavorings, what mix will be your meld? Vanilla bean cream with a touch of tea tree, cocoa butter, castor oil, coils of 4B. Scrunch, 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 the brush a wand like sorcery, each ingredient carefully stretched becoming sweet, sticky taffy. With determined hands, fluffy coils twist to lock. Are you doing anything at the... Twist into each other to form the bantu knot. Repeat, 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 the hands have toiled a sweet smelling crop. Your scored rows now bear taffy bantu knots. But you must not stop. You must not stop. You always color taffy bantu knots. Aluminum cuffs shine like royalty. Puka shells persist like a roiling sea. Twine binds the knots like a garland, rosary. Now the most important step, the most important step. Aerate the taffy knots, adorned your golden face, for the world to envy, to drool for a taste. Thanks. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Brittany. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I know that uh, Kayla Bell was having some connectivity issues. So Kayla, are you on? Yes, I am. Oh, oh, Kayla. <laughs> so good to see you. Um, okay, just a reminder to everybody, uh, if you are anyone but Kayla and myself at the moment, please mute your mics. Um, and Kayla is also going to read us a poem. Okay, hi everyone. I made this poem about four years ago. Um, it's still very relevant today, so I'm going to share it with you guys. It is titled The Invisible Two. They say all lives matter, but that couldn't be true. If that were the case, emphasis on the black lives, we, sh we wouldn't have to do. What was wrong with this hoodie? Why was it so intimidating? How the hell do you die in police custody over lane changing? We get decades in jail over crimes we didn't commit while confessing rapists get three months and a slap on the wrist and positions of power suddenly changes too much for you. A black man in office brought panics of what are we supposed to do? In the media, our teens are painted as murderers, drug dealers, and thugs. But that child can shoot up a school. He's mentally ill, a child in distress, and his crimes brushed under the rug. Imagine having to go through life with the constant need to prove yourself and the feelings of never being able to risk it. Because if you mess up just once, you become another statistic, getting pulled over for a traffic violation, but your heart cannot stand it. Next time you see your family might be at a funeral and they'll have to plan it. We get followed in malls. Our men harassed on the street. Can't even barbecue in peace without a call to the police. They couldn't even say her name when we told them to because that would have made her human like it's supposed to do. I cannot breathe, he said time and time again, but they just couldn't hear him over the color of his skin. If all lives really matter, then why be offended by the word black? It's as if we said to hell with yours, but we never even said that. So before I get done, I decide to help you see this through. I guess I should have started with Black Lives Matter, emphasis on the two. Thank you. Thanks for the silent snaps. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, Kayla. Thank you so much. Um, I'm always in awe of your performance ability in addition to your lyrical skill. So thank you for joining us. Um, okay, we have uh, started off the night um, in a really auspicious way. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Sequoia Maynard, and I'm going to um, show her poems on screen um, so that you all can kind of follow along. And I will mute myself now, Sequoia, if you want yep, to. I'm here. Um, I hope that everyone can hear me. This is sort of the level that I want to speak at. So if this is okay, maybe if I can get some thumbs up. Um, and I just want to thank all of you for being here. Thanks to Ball State, the Honors Program, the English Department, African American Studies, all of the students on campus doing this amazing anti-racist work, this coalitional work. Um, I see you and I am just very excited to be here um, and glad that we can have some sort of connectivity um, when we are all so isolated at this moment. It's a heavy moment. I've been uh, interested in the project of Elegy for um, a long time and maybe we'll talk about that in the discussion and I'm going to read um, strictly elegies today that I've written over um, maybe the past five years or so alongside the movement for Black Lives. This one is called Black Boy Contrapuntal for Trayvon Martin. I am American first. I have black friends and race is past. A civic duty, patrolling the block for a thug, performing the ritual again. He kept looking, staring, relentless, and it was raining. There's been a history of black boys breaking in. They always get away while walking suspiciously tall, talking suspiciously boastful, tasting blood and refusing to call it fear. But I've seen it rise in their eyes, illegible. We all learn our lessons, stand ground and walk. First impression, I don't belong here anymore. Past, invisible, 
odd. I am treated like a thug, a nuisance, suspended again. A walk to clear the brain. It was raining, drops weighty as bullets breaking in the neighborhood. Walking and feeling the need to run. Talking and feeling the need to yell. Tasting something acrid, like adrenaline or fear, hidden in hoodies and headphones. A legible body of a man, boy not yet grown. We all learn our lessons. Walk away, refuse the urge to run. I am American. First impression, I don't belong here anymore. I have black friends and race is past, invisible, odd. I am treated like a civic duty, patrolling the block for a thug, a nuisance, suspended performing the ritual again. A walk to clear the brain. He kept looking, staring, relentless, and it was raining, drops weighty as bullets. There's been a history of black boys breaking in the neighborhood. They always get away while walking and feeling the need to run suspiciously tall, talking and feeling the need to yell suspiciously boastful, tasting something acrid like adrenaline or blood and refusing to call it fear, hidden in hoodies and headphones. I've seen it rise in their eyes. A legible body of a man, boy not yet grown. We all learn our lessons, stand ground, walk away, refuse the urge to run. I think in this portion, I'm just gonna read straight through the poems and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about how they came, came about and what I think they mean. Um, this next one is called Upon Reading the Autopsy of Sandra Bland. The words of the medical examiner read the neck is remarkable for a ligature furrow. And you are unwoven by the combination of these two words, ligature and furrow. Because furrow describes a groove or rut in the ground or in the surface of something like tender skin. A furrow is a depression dug out for seeding. How odd the furrowing set next to ligature, which derives from the Latin ligare, meaning to tie or bind. The word ligature is tough and flexible, like the larynx. It holds the state of being bound or stiffened, like the body in solitary confinement, like the body in rigor mortis in solitary confinement. It moves beyond the act of binding to capture the thing that performs the act of binding, like a cord or a similar something, like a plastic bag. But the ligature is also thread used in surgery to close a vessel or remove a tumor. And you think about how the body is a vessel and how she had no tumors, how the trachea is an instrument moving currents of air into and out of lungs. How in music, the ligature is both the group of notes played as a phrase and the curved line that indicates such a phrase. How remarkable is the spine, which is line and curve and holding up all you have ever loved, a single harmonic texture. And you are reminded of how language folds into itself because the word lig ligature indicates suspension of intellectual or physical powers, leaves no room for miscarriage or epilepsy or prayer. Not to mention, in typography, the ligature is a character that combines multiple letters, like the AE in vertebrae, and so many common words once contained space enough for small couplings. Words like economy and hemorrhage and tragedy and fetus and federal. And you wonder if Sandra knew that bound up in her furrowing was a history of how easily the body rends. Ooh. 
Ooh, that poem is always a tough one for me. Um, and I'll talk about that. But Sandra and I, we were the same age. I loved her fiercely. I was living in Texas. Um, she was arrested and, um, you know, just hours from me on a road in which I live. And that, that poem comes from me wrestling with the autopsy report. All of these poems I'm gonna read are rather heavy. Uh, can I get, uh, if you guys are still with me, maybe a little reaction, a little clap that just says, I'm still here, I'm still listening. All right, all right. Still here, still listening. <laughs> <laughs> this As next always. one. I love you guys. This next one, thank you for listening to me do my thing. This next one is for the in the memory of Tupac Shakur and it's called Epistle. And it starts with an epigraph. Oh, did I skip is the next one. Can we go forward to the Tupac poem? It's called Epistle, sorry, I'm out of order. And it starts with a quote from Tupac. Uh, it's from this interview that he did in 1994, and he's talking about, you know, I don't think that I am going to change the world, but he says, quote, I guarantee I will spark the brain that changes the world. That's our job. And I love Tupac. Um, and I think about him often, and I write about him often, and I write letters to Tupac, and sometimes those letters look like poems, and these are some of them. One. <clears throat> Dear Tupac, you are scattered like jazz across these states. A sorrowful note in Baltimore, a syncopated bruise in Harlem, a gravel-mouthed moan in Oakland, a mustard seed in Compton. You are always already a thefted body, torso dislodged from neck and its bullet wounds, fingers plucked for preservation, Skin flayed, stretched as book binding. Golden tongue gifted to rough waters. Dear Tupac, you are the material evidence of survival, a lifetime of resurrections, a discharge of hauntings, a flashpoint, the roam and wander of post bop, a brilliant star streaking wild across the sky. You are the ring shout of a radical tradition, a prayer, a self-fulfilling prophecy. You are a manifestation of the ecstatic. You are the stuff of elegies and uprisings. You are the sound of feathers in flight. You are the sound a ghost makes when it returns to a body. Part two. Dear Tupac, sometimes when I think of you, I gaze at the moon on a clear night when no wind whips and the coyote slinks through dampened sage and mountains somewhere far from this city that is so loud with people and their echoed mornings, that is so bright with lights and thrum, where invisibility is the new black and breath is a chokehold, where instead of breath, calculations of life after death Dream a world where no longer does iconicity escalate the flesh of boys, and a full clip makes right the ritual of second-class birthings. What a queer art of death, this performance of absence, this ritual of unmaking, where for at least a brief while, the body is witnessed as a body and not a network of misnamings not the particulate matter of psychopathy and urban blight, not a constellation of corporatized desires, not a symbol of struggle, but simply a body at odds with an out of control punishment system. Can you be black and look at this? Three. Dear Tupac, I've enclosed for you a recipe for resurrection. May it be useful. Start with three parts legend. Peel, rib, jaw, and navel. Dust with pearlescent opal. Mix with the ashes of a bombed out house in West Philly. Find whatever footage you can of Stokely. Combine Billy Club and Glock 45. Chop funky baseline and the disappointments of integration. 
grind tattoo into the chalky film of a burning city. Blend until viscous. Let rest and let rise. Now, imagine the boy. Imagine the boy unbulleted, unpunctured. Imagine the boy intact, unpenetrated. Imagine the boy and his body out of time, not supposed to be here, but here and breathing anyway. Imagine the boy not dead. This is what you've hungered for. That's the end of that poem. Emily, I'm not keeping my time, so are you keeping time for me? I am, you're good. Okay, perfect. <sighs> Let's see, can we go back up to the Muhammad Ali poem? Yeah. This one I skipped over. Yeah. Uh, so upon Muhammad Ali's death, I was just devastated and a long series of poems came out of me. And I was thinking about how just, just wallowing and how unfair it is, it is that, you know, this brilliant mind and body and voice that was Muhammad Ali was forsaken of his speech, was forsaken of his grace and agility, um, you know, with Parkinson's disease. And I was wondering what he might say in this moment, right? This monumental movement for Black Lives moment. Um, so this poem comes out of that. It's actually a long poem that goes 12 rounds, like the box and right, but I am gonna read just two rounds um, here. It has a weird title. It's called the substantia nigra. So that's a part of the brain that is, we can think of it like the center for neurons, uh, where neurons are produced and where they do their thing. And when dopamine neurons die in that part of the brain, and that's Latin for the black substance, that's what results in slurred speech and um, you know, impaired mobility of Parkinson's. So that's where that comes from. The substantia nigra, or what Ali might say. One, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Emmett gone nearly 10 years now, and you are reminded how the submerged body will float despite waiting, and how those folk were lynched because Jack proved mark men can startle like prismatic color through the static of radio and how those Asiatic people in Vietnam might find a vision of Brother Malcolm sparking liberation to be universal truth. That men who dare cultivate, excuse me, that men who dare cultivate butterfly philosophies and spread their butterfly wings, bear the distinctive hum of the bruised and burning sting nestled deep in tender meat. And how a bomb will tear the delicate bodies of four little black girls like a bomb tears the delicate bodies of four little yellow girls too. For surely when history pendulates a steady rhythm, even the greatest of great nations will sink and plunge in the shadow of the diving bee. Two, impossible is not a declaration, it's a dare. Emmett gone nearly 60 years now, and you are reminded how the broken spine remains the impossible indicator of brokenness despite its breaking, and how the spectacle of a splayed and summer sunned body is nothing more than the symbol re-symbolized, and how you've witnessed this before, this record of not conclusive enough to convict, this record of not conclusive enough to conclude conclusions, this record a watering of grief wetting wings too heavy for escape. And if the thundering be independent declaration called free, then wings will regenerate when oiled between bristles that rise along its scarlet underside that is so brittle and so light. For under the weight of bulleted blows, the body drops like a body drops under the weight of bulleted blows. Surely the backward boomerang of history is a dare. So that's two parts of that poem. Mm. 
Let's see where we are in the packet and also where we are on time. Okay. I was thinking maybe on Earth something is always burning. I believe that's the last one in the packet. Sure, perfect. Um, so I have written very few poems during quarantine and I figured I would close with a couple of quarantine poems. And I'm going to read these little things that I've been writing. I'm not quite sure what they are. Um, they're kind of like little songs, little like morality tales. They're very, very short. And I've written several of them. And there's this girl that keeps coming up in them. And I've named her Little Girl Blue. And I think that I might be Little Girl Blue. And I'm interested in seeing how Little Girl Blue has been developing. So this is not in the packet, but I'm going to read just two of those. And then I'll read this last quarantine poem that's on the screen. So for these just two little short, I'm going to call them ditties. <laughs> um, they won't be on the screen. So Little Girl Blue, one. Little Girl Blue, you blew your horn of morning and warning into whirlwind and pollen squalls. You asked, where we get clean, in the lake or in the stream, in the break or in the dream, or somewhere, someplace in between. Little girl blue, you traded your horn for a cry, but when you hailed into the gales only a small faint sigh, and two white doves cooing my, oh my. Hey blue girl, girl blue, what you gonna do? It's coming. And the second one is Little Girl Blue 2. Across an ocean of time and a sea of space, the currents stay swift, the waters rage, rage, rage. The cities buckle and the land replenishes. Proof nothing in this world diminishes your splendor, Blue Girl, for energy never dies just moves on, transfigures, makes use, and revives. So go on, blue girl, little girl blue. The world is made of you. My, oh my. I figured we need something a little bit light before I um, close with this last poem. Yeah, is one more poem okay, Emily? Okay, perfect. This one is called, this is really new. I wrote this like maybe two days ago. I haven't read it aloud. I figured I'd test it out. I'm just glad. I didn't think that I, I didn't know if I was a poet anymore. I've just been unable to write. So this is what has come out of me. I titled it On Earth, Something is Always Burning. In seaside cities, the breeze is steady. The smell of smoke carries inland. A neighborhood is burning. A library is burning. A body burns. Oh Lord, the smallest defiance brings a river of fire. On earth, something is always burning. We find ourselves coughing conversations into ash. We chalk charred memories through rubble remains. We have witnessed so much. We fold ourselves between wings of crinoline and wax. We dust our bodies clean as best we can. We line one deliberate eye with charcoal. We name ourselves poets. We call the page something to strain against. We call the poem a stacking of self and self, cantus firmus. However, the truth is simple. All of it is propaganda, another way of saying no, another way to cleave sense and nonsense, another way to ask unanswerable questions like, how does the moon untether her tides? When might the sky cease her burn? Will the boat reach shore or the rocket blast us away? And the Lord replies, beloved, you are birthed from an insurgent blues. Your sigh is a funeral march. Listen for the sound of a slow and torturous collapse. Listen for the bleat of a creature now dead. Concentrate on the texture of indigo. 
you will know by the ringing in your ears and the rattle against your ribs. You will know by the purple of a flower blooming on the edge of a barren field. What was your youth anyway? And that's my time. Thank you. That was amazing, Sequoia. Insurgent Blues. Love it. Um, okay, so we're going to transition now to another incredible poet and visual artist as well, Darlene Anita Scott, who if you weren't here when we started, um, she is also co-editor of Revisiting the Elegy in the Black Lives Matter era uh, with myself and Sequoia and the late Tiffany Austin. Um, and so I'm really excited for you all to hear Darlene's poems tonight. Um, and I'm going to do the same thing I did with Sequoia, where I'm going to um, share my screen so that you can kind of read along. Um, but also, Darlene, if you want to um, go off script, just let me know. <laughs> I'll that you. OK. Let me see. Can I be heard? I don't think I can be heard. All right. There we go. OK. Hi. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Can you hear me? I feel like. My voice is really low. I can hear you pretty well, actually. Just turning my volume up. Yeah, maybe just a little bit. Is that better? Yeah, that's good. OK. Yeah. Um, so first, let me say my um, the coin first of all. I can't believe I have to follow that. But, um, but thank you. And thank you all for being here tonight. I'm going to read a couple of poems that come from the, um, the anthology, from the Revisiting the LG Anthology, and then I'm going to read some that are not in there. So what I wrote for Revisiting, I should start with that because that's where I'm going to start reading. Um, I wrote a crown of sonnets. And so if you're familiar with the sonnet form, the sonnet is a traditional form of poetry, 14 lines, two verses or stanzas, and an end couplet, which is um, two lines, right? And so when, when I was writing this crown of sonnets, that means that I was writing a series of these 14 line poems. The series, um, the reason we call it a crown is because what we do is we use the first, the last line of the poem preceding it to begin the next poem. So I wrote this crown with the idea of imagining all of the ways that Black people survive. Um, not just police violence, but survive in this world. So anyone who is alive and Black in America right now is a survivor, right? Um, and, and, and so I was interested in when we talk about elegy, we talk about loss, and we talk about the loss of a actual person. But what are the other losses that are experienced by those people who are survivors? So that I've been interested in in writing elegy so what you're going to hear is, again, a couple of the, a, a few of the poems from the series that are in the collection, as well as some elegies that exist outside of it. And kind of like Sequoia, I won't spend a lot of time talking about each one of the individual poems. Um, I'll kind of go right through, and then in the Q&A, we can talk about them, any individual ones if you want to. So let's start with, um, with number three in that series I was talking about. Again, the series is called A Series of Survivals. And so I'm going to read a series of survivals, numbers three and, and four. Three, to feel and be felt surely will unmake the night of your skin and his. Fill your inbox with clumsy, tender imagery. Cook meals like spaghetti. He says he has more, but he doesn't, and you both know it. Neither of you know where you are going from here. Neither of you can watch the news without wincing go breathy and handsy to manufacture what feels like it's disappearing, fast as the space between the first handshake and the sheet. Here you are. Lifetime in the nighttime, he decreed. You dare the prophecy. Collect your things until again is a groove and you lose grounds for an objection. You hold on to each other like fear, release with the same verve. Every time he collects your hair in his hands, buries his nose in it as if to suffocate himself into the night. Let's, in the morning, you challenge. Why say there is always morning when it's not true? And so it comes, morning. Number four. And so it comes, morning. 
finds my dad reading the obituaries. Ours is the tiniest of towns. Promise of morning has not settled there even. Our side of it, churches and laborers, black and brown, zoned to draw our children's reach to breach it as cartoon and excuse. After the South, Vietnam and Virginia, maybe his ritual is survivor's penance, maybe muscle memory. Eyes and ears fine-tuned as the report he repeats about boys same age as his grandson, kidnapped from a late night corner, curfew beaten into their bodies in the back of a cruiser, back of the lot, by the neighborhood favorite. My dad knows he knew there were eyes, had no reason for care, fear, surrender. There are many ways to thin a body, disappear it without the puff, smoke, or circumstance of its singular and immediate end. The next poem um, elegizes Latasha Harlins. Latasha Harlins was the teenager who was um, shot in 1991, shortly after the Rodney King tape became public. And so um, many people knew about her murder, but I, I found that it got overshadowed largely um, by the Rodney King tape. Watershed, March 16th, 1991. It starts with a news report that came out around the same time. This is not television. This is not the movies. This is real life. This was how Deputy District Attorney Roxanne Carvajal cautioned a jury before showing them the last seconds of Latasha Harlins's life as, ca as captured by a security camera on March 16, 1991. The video showed the 15-year-old girl first struggling with Soon Jadu, the owner of Empire Liquor Market in Delhi on South Figueroa Street, then walking away and finally falling down, having been shot in the head by Du. I imagine March 5th, 1991, while she was still abbreviation. I imagine myself, high on sugar, rap city, a boy. I imagine the black man canvas under police batons that mark him in symbolism blotted all over my screen. I imagine I quickly memorized his name. I imagine March 16th, 1991, when the ticker tape announced hers first and last that I began the reluctant task of dispensing the surprise of death into my 15-year-old imagination. I imagine that in those last seconds, it was surprise holding her upright before she crumpled into her death. Surprised that 15 was it. Surprised at the lump in her throat that had been for the past six years, her dead mother, that kept her company and quiet, yet moved from like stone from tomb to warn this woman on this day that she had no intentions of stealing orange juice. Surprised maybe that legs trained on the track and in intricate gumboot dances could not find strength to escape heat so hot it was cool entering the back of her UCLA Bruins cap. The curl in the bang that tickled her neck flattened under the flow and weight of so much blood that it met and darkened her dark blue dickies, or surprised that it was 1991. History books, not newspapers and sound bites, recorded black girl bodies as flimsy opportunities for entry, if they recorded them at all. Surprised that her black girl body, excuse me, surprised that her black girl body was about to be history. Maybe she heard her favorite music instead of the whistle that is the speed of life passing around and through, all the black girl bodies living and dying during that time, like mine, imagining Mrs. Jewel, the wooden boards of her corner store holding us barely. They creaked under the after-school weight of our bodies' brown as, sassy with hunger and salty insults, curled in the direction of her veiled, mostly naked assaults, like spilling change on the counter to avoid contact with our skin. The women who knew, Mrs. Rosita, my grandmother, tried to bake and freeze us away from her store. I imagine they did not want us to fall into a death with surprise and didn't trust what entered us from her spotted hands. I imagine Tammy, also 15, 
skin light like a beacon to boys, not as bright as the one I imagined she followed, having been raised Baptist. I imagine she was not as pregnant as the rumors hissed by one of those probably also hissing boys and only as hot as any black girl body that moves through life with such velocity, who hears music over the whistle and moves to it. I am not able to imagine if she held her body upright through the surprise of death, whether it was big or little, or how it might have entered her body with the surge of a bullet or the steady pace of disease. When I remember her, I only, I only imagine myself high on sugar, rap city, and a boy, 15, abbreviated and impenetrable. Mm. Ars Poetica of the Monkey Bars. How the metal bars wound the pads of our gripping fists, first a callus of warning, then blisters. How we are chided with stinging alcohol. How they leak through white gauze and defiance. How we refuse to stay away from those bars through to healing. How sky becomes ground. How we own gravity. How we peer the big kids across the grass border to the patch of asphalt they transform into rucker. How a caution tape of their bodies contains the swell of them in Saturday best until it rips against dances to music that makes the afternoon bleed. How often we regale our own blood. How our chests balloon, proud hemorrhages. <laughs> So the next poem, I guess I will say something about it. The next poem um, elegizes Sandra Bland. And one of the things I guess that may be apparent or not is that when I approach the elegy, I tend to subvert the form. So you will hear a narrative that doesn't necessarily center the person lost. This is not a story about bees. And it starts with um, an epigraph from Lauren Hill's song, Lost Ones. If a thing tests me, run from me gun. Can't take a threat to me newborn son. I have four sisters. They are all scared of bees. In 1993, a bee flew through an open window. So Diane hurtled her car into a tree to save her son from its venom. In 1998, this is how the story goes. Debbie is swollen with my not yet niece whose brother is a recorder in his car seat. My twin is passenger and new black boy mom, edema of recent birth puffy beneath her skin. On a stretch of Webb's lane along the tracks, a shriller siren pierces an idyllic night, casts the minivan in a red and blue strobe. White halogen, first on the sun, lands on Debbie, dervish of indignation. Usually 10 and two, she's an erratic drone, her sun to the light, light to the sun, sun to light, light to sun, light, sun, light. For bees, dark colors translate to imminent threat. Panagers, bears, raccoons. My sisters reprimand the halogen, demand its reasons staccato and swift as every hip hop song my mom muted it for supper and homework. Fast, my mom warned, is crash prone. You, shut up. Passenger, ID. Unfeasible, aerodynamically. These have evolved flight muscles to generate power where speed isn't available. Their wings oscillate around 230 beats per second, even when hauling nectar or pollen. By July 2015, we are four sons between us. Someone else's sister is Debbie's turmeric, expectant, and protective, pulled over on a lazy road. We have evolved flight muscles. Someone else's sister has died in flight. My mom worries my sisters have lost their fear of bees. And I'm going to close with two poems um, returning to that series of survivals, that crown of sonnets. So I'm going to read, num read numbers 10 and 11. 10. Airbrush caricatures 
captioned with improper names, listed like infographics connected crisp and modern with an ampersand, or poor whispers on cotton shirts that leave spittle suspended in air or land against the skin like buckshot. Announcements we wear against our skin like placards, I am a man, but mostly we are boys and girls, loud as hungry baby birds, hairless, cold, extended necks reaching so eager for life we threaten to tip our nest. Too often we do. And the nests get decorated with bottles, bears, notes of never forget or till we meet again. Crowns chip and tilt. Ever wondered if forgetting is the sip in the fountain of youth? If hungry baby birds feed on themselves? Ever worn a placard against your still beating heart? This is just to say, after enough rain, even murals fade. This is just to say, after enough blows, a lot of people become debilitated. Mm. Number 11. A lot of people become debilitated insert Vanita Browder. A lot of people become angry, insert Micah Johnson. There are even more ways to make us the enemy, insert Ramsey Orta. Even more ways to make us disappear, insert Corinne Gaines. Have we any right to make human souls face what we face today, insert Cody and Carson. Ought children be born to us? Insert Diana. And before I close, I'll explain some of those names and those, those quotes. You see the footnotes. Um, the first quote, a lot of people become debilitated, comes from uh, Geneva Reed Veal, who is the mother of Sandra Bland. And in an article, she talks about being of justice for her daughter. Janita Brown, you see in line two, is the mother of Khalif Browder. Khalif Browder was 16 years old when he was um, accused of stealing a backpack and sent to Rikers Island. Um, he was released three years later and found not guilty that he had not committed the crime. And he uh, committed suicide due to the abuse he suffered there. Benita Browder is his mother and she fought on his behalf, but she would eventually die only a couple of years after her son due to heart failure. Michael Johnson is the young man who was radicalized by Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement, and he ambushed police in Dallas, Texas, and was ultimately killed. Um, Ramsey Orta is the gentleman who uh, recorded Eric Garner's arrest and murder. He was eventually imprisoned as well um, and harassed there. Corinne Gaines is the young woman from Baltimore. She was being served a warrant in her home and did not want to let the police in. They shot her and they also shot her son. She died, her son did not. Cody and Carson are her other children who were not home at the time. And Diana is the daughter of Diamond Reynolds. Diamond Reynolds was the, the fiance of Philando Castile in Minnesota. She was driving the car when it was pulled over. Philando Castile, if you will remember, was asked for his ID. He went to reach for his ID and indicated that he had a um, and the officer shot him and he died there in the car, Diana in the back seat watching all of this. And the quotes that you see come from um, Patric Patrice Con Cullors, who is the co-founder of the Black Lives Matters movement. She writes in When They Call Us Ter When They Call You Terrorists, her autobiography about the ways in which we're made to disappear, um, even when we are not necessarily felled by police violence. And W.E.B. Du Bois writes in The Souls of Black Folk um, about his firstborn son. His firstborn son was, um, was an infant when he passed away. And so when he's elegizing his son, he's also talking about the problem of the color line and if it was even worth it to have children and invite them into this world. So that is, um, that is my, my portion. I guess we go into the Q&A from here. Thank you for listening. Oh, Darlene, that was so moving. And I, there was such symmetry to that. And um, I, I'm going to ask some questions now. And then um, for those of you who have questions that you were kind of thinking about, 
uh, as we were listening, then you can start putting them in the chat and um, we will turn to them shortly. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, um, the poems you're just reading and, and really thoughtfully talking us through that last, that last sonnet, in a sense, in the crown, um, I, you know, I was thinking about like what compels um, each of you to write elegies. And in some ways, when I asked that question, it seems so obvious because the stakes are so incredibly high, right? But um, at the same time, I mean, there's lots of modes that um, both of you have written in or expressed yourselves in. So I'd like to just kind of start this off by asking each of you to talk about, or even in conjunction, like, why the elegy and and sort of what um what what attracts you to that form what's the utility of that form for you i just want to say darlene that was so beautiful oh my gosh and i don't know if for this q a portion we just kind of just want to be both um off mute or whatever and go back and forth I'm fine with that. But um, yeah, elegy. I like to say that I have always written sad girl poems. And I think I've always kind of just been a sad girl writer. And I started writing poetry um, really, really early. I relate to people like Maya Angelou and Audre Lorde who write in their stories about how they lost their speech for some time because there was some kind of trauma that happened in their lives and turn to the written word, turn to language. And that's quite similar to me. And my childhood was beautiful in so many ways, but I also did experience, you know, dislocation, um, you know, foster care and eventually becoming adopted by an amazing single black woman. Um, but you know, that it, the page became a place for me to wrestle and reckon and really become attuned to my own individual sadness. And it wasn't an overwhelming sadness or an overwhelming grief, but just this thin, mellow, muted sadness that I've, I've always kind of carried with me. And it was really Hurricane Katrina that was a turning point for me. Um, you know, Elizabeth Alexander, the poet and scholar and professor, brilliant, published this, um, editorial in the New Yorker called the Trayvon Generation um, that if you haven't read it everyone in the chat go read it it's absolutely stunning and she's thinking about you know particularly young black people who have been growing up and in these last 20 years are being shaped um, by the 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 overwhelming tide of these um, you know viral images of our of of our bodies being constrained and killed. And thinking about all the ways that we carry that with us. And for me, Hurricane Katrina, I was living in North Carolina at the time in college. Um, that became a moment for me where I saw how black life could be devalued um, and thought of as disposable and became a point where I really became interested in learning about um, Black history and using that within poetry to speak to a present moment. I'll stop there because I don't want to say too much, but um, we can go back and forth on this, Darlene. <laughs> sure. Um, like you, I have the same uh, history as in I started writing really early. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I did start writing in some ways to to express some sort of grief, but I didn't, I didn't have any major losses that I recall um, in my life, like, you know, that, that were outside of the realm of what loss would be, as in I lost a grandparent, a grandmother um, fairly early, but didn't experience a lot of loss. And so the grief um, that I would write about was, was very just angsty, I guess, you know, so I kind of came to it that way. Um, but as I as I continue to write, I don't think that I looked at it as I'm writing elegy or I'm coming to this as elegy. I don't think I recognize it that recognize it as a form or that's what I was doing. But like when I was reading the poem Watershed, for instance, that was a watershed moment for me. We were the same age, kind of like you talk about being the same age as Sandra Bland, Sequoia, um, Latasha, and I were the same age, and and then another um, classmate of mine died fairly suddenly. And this was kind of my reckoning with my own mortality, I suppose. 
And so that was a, a watershed moment in that way, but it was also a watershed moment in the sense that, um, that I recognized that black girl bodies, that black bodies were expendable. And I think I had probably recognized that really early on. I was one of those, those kind of thoughtful maybe kids. Like I, I remember reading the newspaper um, or at least looking at the headlines. I don't know that I understood everything that I was seeing or reading, but I remember reading the newspaper as early as like 10 and, and trying to make sense of some things. Um, and I remember seeing um, one of the one of the um, things, a couple of events that stood out to me that were that made national news because I grew up in a small town, so it wasn't a lot that was happening in my town. Um, one was the the subway vigilante Bernard Getz, who shot like four or five black teenagers in the New York subway around Christmas. And I I don't know how old I was. That was somewhere between fourth and sixth grade, but I remember that standing out to me a lot. Um, the way that he was treated, and that is Bernard Getz, the, the shooter, the way that the young men were presented. I remember the Central Park Five. I remember when that happened. Um, I'm not sure how old I was when all that happened, but all of these things, were, um, they affected me a lot, even, even as they seem to be very separate from my small town life, if you will. And, um, and I think that when I started thinking about elegy as elegy, like I'm writing about these losses, I'm writing about these kinds of things, then it was typically outside from outside of myself. It was about these larger events, but how these larger events, kind of like the murder of Latasha Harlins, how they intersected with my own life and my own um, Black experience, really, because I did know, I wasn't, um, I wasn't unclear about racism, I'll say that. Like, you know, I, I knew that from, from very early on, even if that racism was not physically violent in the way that those, um, those murders and those, those, um, those deaths were. So, so I think I came, when I, when I think about how I came to Elegy, I come to Elegy as a black person in America. Um, and if you're black in America, then you know something about loss, even if that loss is not for your your individual body right that loss is um that loss can be the loss of, of a sense of security which i think i probably now i can articulate that i didn't know it then but i think i understood that i had a loss of security in my body just by virtue of being black i, I was hyper aware of that um and I, I think i said i was going to talk about two events i said bernard gets the other one i would say was which was much earlier in my life but very present was the Atlanta child murders. And so even as a child, I knew I was not safe in my body as a black girl, as a black person. And, um, and so if I started writing early and I was writing about these things, then I came to Elegy again, just by virtue of being black in America. Darlene, we have so many resonances between our work. As you were reading, you know, the image of the bees also mm -hmm. appear in both of our poems. We're both um, writing poems, entering and the discourse about Sandra Bland, but from oblique ways, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Latasha Harlins is also someone that compels both my scholarship and um, my, my, my poet bo voice. Um, and we have a little bit of an age gap between the two of us, but I was living in Los Angeles and I was a very, very young girl um, when, through Latasha Harlins, Rodney King, and the Los Angeles riots. And those uprisings were very, um, they just shaped my worldview in a very mm -hmm. sharp and distinctive way. Mm -hmm. And I come back to that period often. So actually me talking about Tupac and in my scholarly work, thinking about Tupac and Kendrick Lamar and that sort of inheritance is actually me returning to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. thinking about the um, sort of rebellious, ethos that had been building there for quite some time um, and the sort of aftermath of that uprising mm -hmm. and how that city um, sort of doubled down on law and order instead of moving into a place of um, justice and equity. Mm -hmm. um, sort of seeing the backlash of rebellion and uh, in this country. So yeah, that is something that I return to often. We're compelled by similar moments. Yeah. There are so many good questions in the chat too, I'm noticing. 
I know. Um, I know. I want. I want to get to one question um, before we go to to the chat, just because I think it it might be important for some of the people who haven't yet asked questions. And it's so interesting that you're talking about LA. You know, the during the first week of classes. Um, I was showing many of the students on this call and I will remember we watched a clip of Tony Morrison in 92 um, in an interview you've both probably seen it with Charlie Rose. Um, we don't have to get into Charlie Rose but but Tony Morrison is talking about how you know he's kind of asking her what should I do you know and she's saying like you know racism is something white people created leave me out of it right and, and and deal with it on your own um and that just makes me kind of think through um the you know the work that you all are doing in your in your art but also as professors and on you know the work that we're engaged in in classrooms and on campuses i mean sequoia you're teaching at an hbcu now darlene you know you were teaching at an HBCU, we're at a PWI. Um, so obviously the kind of demographics and the, the climate, the history of the campus inform all of this. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts about just the role that you think the campus and the classroom kind of plays in the movement for Black Lives or potentially like, you know, poetry as a, as a kind of intersection there? That's a big question, I realize. It's a big question, but it's a good question. Uh, Darlene, did you want to kick us off or? You can start. I just, I don't think it can be sort of um, stated enough. I don't think it can be overstated, the role of classroom and social justice movements, um, the role of students. And I don't think that all of the work happens there, but I think that necessary work happens there and we can see that historically. So I look back to people like Sonia Sanchez, Miss Sonia Sanchez, who is still living with us, right? Our living ancestor who has produced such amazing poetry. Um, has done such amazing activist work and is also you know large in part responsible along with collaborators alongside her for making sure that we have black studies programs ethnic studies programs on college campuses right and that was done um, with her body through her poetry in conjunction with student activists on campus so i see i i think of someone like her and i i see the potential of moving the dial, moving the needle. Um, I think that what happens in classrooms is essential. You know, students are there. They are of the Trayvon generation. They have questions. We give them language. We unpack the personal and the political. I'm specifically thinking about our Black feminist studies classes, right, that are unafraid of going to that intersection of the personal and the political. Um, I'm thinking how we give them, we give students history and language um, and work that is relevant to their lives. And, you know, I think classrooms also look like a lot of things. They happen on universities, but classrooms can also pop up in the most unexpected of places. So something that's been beautiful in my life, you know, I recently have connected back to one of my first cousins. We're like the same age. We both went through college, you know, went to different parts of the country and now are settled in our careers. And he calls me, you know, he's like Professor Maynor and his last name is also Maynor. And I'm like, yes, Jonathan. And he just wants all the book recommendations. And we talk about, you know, liberation theology and, interesting texts and poetry and he is consuming all of this work and the work we do i consider that a classroom right mm -hmm. i'm having conversations with my mother and we are creating these classrooms so it happens at the interpersonal level too mm -hmm. and i i just think it's so important to have the sort of technical language and the critical thinking nuance that comes in classrooms but also to be able to translate across um communities right to not only be um able to like use fancy jargon but also to take it into the real world and do things with it you know yeah yeah like what you were saying about the interpersonal part you know i think so the the thing about <laughs> the thing about education and and so forth and i recognize i implicate myself when i say this is that 
higher education is, is a privilege, right? The, a, a privileged space. Um, and so in that space, what, what I, I run the risk of is saying that we're giving this knowledge in this privileged space and it's a, it's a specific set of people who are gonna have this knowledge. So I think it's really critical that when I'm thinking about um, the classroom, that I'm thinking about that interpersonal part, like that these students will eventually become someone's mother or father, will eventually come, become someone's teacher, will become voters if they're not already, um, will become all of these things. So whatever, whatever I'm engaging in, in that space, I'm engaging it with the idea that, that they're going to go out into the world with it, right? And, and, and so I, I like to think of my classrooms as not as a space in which I impart knowledge, but that I teach them to ask questions the same way that I ask questions. If, if they become, so yeah, if they, if they become question askers, right, it, it, that, that is provoking thought. And that, that's our goal, right, to, to provoke thought. Here is a space, when we think of education, where one's mind is supposed to be open, right, to new ideas and to asking questions and to thinking about ideas and so forth. And then eventually they will put those ideas into practice in some way. And so, um, but I can't determine what that practice looks like. And in fact, I don't think that that's my job at all as an educator, I, but I do think it's my job to, to provoke that thinking and to, pro and then of course the, the action, the thought precedes the action. So first they start thinking about it and then hopefully they're thinking about it in new ways um, that perhaps they didn't think of before. And that's what will exclude um, my classroom or keep my classroom bec from becoming that privileged space where we end up kind of reinforcing the status quo, right? Um, which I think is, is, is a danger um, that we face in higher education is, is, is like, like, I guess the example I would use is like teaching from the text. And I think most students can appreciate when you don't teach directly from a text because texts tend to be very, um, very much gatekeepers, right? They, they, they keep knowledge, they canonize knowledge and they say, this is, this is the knowledge you must know. And so um, an instruction when I say, I'm gonna teach outside of this textbook, I'm gonna bring in some other ideas. I want you to think about some other things in addition to this very specific canon, then that, again, that provokes thought. And if I provoke the thinking, then eventually it will lead to the action. And that's how our classes, our classrooms and our um, educational spaces can become spaces of activism because we provoke action if we provoke thought. I also love some of the lessons that just come out of the classroom. So I'm thinking about how the classroom teaches us to cite our sources to be citational, to cite Black women, right? So we're not going to all go out and try to start our own organizations. We're going to join these organizations that Black women have been building up for a long time, right? It teaches us to refer to experts, right? So I know that this poetry thing, this teaching African American literature thing is what I do. But when I go into an organizing space, Mm -hmm. I listen to activists and organizers who have been doing that work and classrooms mm -hmm. teach us that about expertise, right? Mm -hmm. I also think this is key as readers, as literate, empathetic, curious readers. I hope that our classrooms are teaching not to passively read or I, I hope that our, our classrooms are teaching us to wrestle with the work, to return to the work, to revisit it, to not just read one text. It's not enough to read, you know, the new Jim Crow, which is amazing and everyone should read, but you gotta go further. After you read that, read Slavery by Another Name, then read Beloved, you know, to always have that hunger and curiosity. And I think that is our um, duty is to teach the love and the joy of that, that, mm -hmm. um, knowledge gaining to others that might not have an intimate uh, relationship, right? To learning like that. Beautifully put. Um, yeah, for those of you who, who haven't heard of Sight Black Women, I, I put their, their website in the chat there. Um, and just thinking about, you know, kind of imbuing radical skepticism, um, I think is really key. We have some really good questions from students. So I'm going to bring in a couple that I see and then I'm going to go back up because I know there were some questions about form. But Colby has this question about how is 
uh, writing in the elegiac form brought healing to your lives and possibly your readers? Has it benefited you emotionally to dive into mourning and Black grief? I'll, I'll start, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I, I do think that it's been helpful for me. Um, when, I, when I entered specifically into this project, um, I entered into it as a, a really close friend of Tiffany, um, our co-editor. And, I, and, and so, so writing through this idea, and she does appear in one of the series, um, writing through this was help, helped me to get through, through that grief, through the grief of her loss. So very specifically um, with this project, I would say absolutely. Outside of that, if I talk about elegy more broadly or my writing of elegy more broadly, it's the same thing. Like I, when I think about, when I was talking about Latasha Harlins and Watershed, I'll use that as an example. And even the, the this is not a story about bees where I'm thinking about Sandra Bland. Um, I, I guess I had questions, you know, like um, with Latasha Harlins, I, I, I was 15. I didn't really at 15 have a way of articulating how I felt about this, but I did know that I felt something about it. And so returning to it helped me to figure out what I was feeling about it and why this was such a watershed moment for me. So um, in helping myself, like in, 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 in helping myself to get through the grieving process and the loss of these things, and you know, thinking about Sandra Bland and the fact that like her, I have sisters and I have sisters who have been stopped on a lonely road, you know, um, and, 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 you know, they just didn't end up the same way as, as Sandra Bland. They didn't end up getting arrested. They didn't end up dying in that interaction. But as I, I remember that one, that case particularly resonating with me for those reasons. So those have been, um, so personally, I guess the bottom line is that personally, the, um, the elegiac form has been very useful for me in, in moving through um, a grieving process. It doesn't, doesn't mean the process ends or it doesn't mean that it goes in a completely linear pattern because I write it and then I'm over it, but, um, but it has been helpful. What has it done for me to, has it helped others? You know, honestly, I'm not sure, but maybe that gives them an opportunity to wrestle with their own questions, their own watershed moments, why certain cases resonate so much with them. Because there are cases, all of them, are, are tragic, all of them hurt us, all of them call our, our attention, but some resonate more than others. And then you, you wonder why is it this case resonates more with me than another. So when I'm wrestling with that, when I'm asking myself those questions, um, I'm hoping that possibly readers start to ask themselves the same questions, you know, which case resonates with me and why? Like, I, I, I often think of this and I, I think I'll end here, Trayvon Martin became a tipping point. Um, but, you know, those of us who have been around for a minute, <laughs> that's a nice way to say it, right? <laughs> those of us who have been around for a minute remember cases well before that. Like, we remember Sean Bell, you know. Um, we remember Patrick Dorisman. We remember Amadou Diallo. Like, you know, we remember 41 shots. They shot at that man 41 times, you know, um, because he fit the description. Right, and, and we remember the protests that happened there. And so, um, so what are your watershed moments? I guess I would say, you know, think about which ones are your watershed. This is, um, sadly, this is not new, right? This is not new. And, but there are going to be some cases like Trayvon Martin that really resonate. And it was because of Trayvon Martin's murder that we saw this momentum build. Um, and, and so I think Sequoia referenced it, the, the Trayvon Martin generation, you know. Um, we have this, this generation of people and that was their watershed moment. But you referenced it with Sequoia when you talked about um, Muhammad Ali, when you did those poems, Emmett Till was a tipping point for a very specific generation. So there have been many tipping points, there have been many watershed moments, and, um, and those are just some of mine. But I, I, I guess I'm saying I hope that they engage other people to consider which ones are theirs and that those things then activate them to do something um, in their lived experience, you know, that, that counters this narrative. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we, the, you know, the summer 
um, we saw a lot of people activated by George Floyd's death, right? Like that was their watershed moment. Mm -hmm. um, Breonna Taylor. Yeah, Breonna yeah. Taylor. So we're yeah. yeah. It was a monumental yeah. summer. Yeah. I don't have too much to add to it because Darlene is just so beautiful. But when it comes to healing, I would say yes. I would say that the process also, I think so impart, important and smart what Darlene said, not linear, not expected, surprising, going at its own pace, recursive, turning back in on itself, oscillating. And isn't that how we're all feeling during this time? Disoriented, one moment joy, one minute sadness. It's just a lot. Um, and that's been my experience with um, the elegy. But yes, it has been healing. And the healing part for me comes in the performance. So a lot of these poems are published. A lot of them are, you know, two of them, Trayvon Martin and the Sandra Bland poem are in the book. Other poems are in other places. But quite frankly, when it comes to these elegies, I don't give a damn if they're in a publication. For me, the work is performing it two rooms like this, I will perform the Sandra Bland poem to any crowd who is willing to listen, you know, for as long as I can. Um, so the healing for me is the gift of giving the poem and hoping that it moves through someone. And when Darlene is talking about activation, catalyzing, yes. And when I think about this catalysis, for me, it doesn't always have to be something grand or you know, obvious. It can be a small internal shift where maybe someone thinks a little differently or hears a little differently or, you know, feels something. If the poem makes you feel something, I think that I'm doing my job. Absolutely. Um, well, I can't imagine that there's anyone on this call tonight that isn't feeling many things. <laughs> um, in response to both of you and your beautiful work. Um, I, I want to ask a question about form because a couple of students were curious about like very um, specific details about the kind of formal choices that each of you were making. So maybe just to kind of broaden it out and answer, you know, those multiple questions about form. Could each of you kind of talk about um, making those formal choices, like when to have a space or a dash or, you know, lineation. Um, Sequoia, you started out with a contrapuntal. Obviously, Darlene shared her crown with us, which is amazing. So I guess, yeah, just questions about form, um, you know, go in the direction that feels right. I don't mind starting us off. How about you, Darlene? Do you want to start? Here you go. Okay. Um, you know, when I, so Black Boy Contrapuntal, I'll start there, right? Two voices. Initially, I thought it was Zimmerman and Trayvon. I still think it's that, but kind of not also. And then reading those, po those voices together, we get this third unknown, unknown voice. And for me, this poem was all about, you know, it looks like this. It was all about um, the moment of contact these two people, these two bodies encountering one another and um, what could occur in those points of contact. So for me, the contrapuntal is this form that allows for that kind of back and forth, um, allows for two voices. And the blending for me is supposed to be chaotic. The voices blend into each other. You don't know who is speaking, who is, you know, the perpetrator and the victim in this moment. How do we come to those decisions? What sort of narratives um, inform us to make decisions, right, about who is the perpetrator? And then it ends with that last line, stand ground, walk away, refuse the urge to run. That's those are oxymorons. You can't do all of those things at the same time, right? And for me, that's like the, the poet saying, what is the Black body to do in this moment of encounter when every move seems like a wrong move, you know? Um, this, yeah, all of my poems are really driven by form. And it's, if there's something that I'm trying to get at, Sandra Bland and the ligature mark, I was thinking about containment, having that poem and uh, be, you know, 
cell-like. I was thinking about Sandra's body in the cell, but I'm also thinking about breath beyond the cell. This is a poem about breath, so I, it was necessary for me to have all that white space. All of those things come into mind when I'm making the poem, shaping the poem. I want the form to reflect and propel, you know, the content, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I start with form, um, as in I put words on the page, and sometimes, and this is going to sound really esoteric, but sometimes the, um, the, the, the poem will tell me the form it wants. I have to say, I used to be really resistant to form. Like, I thought I only wanted to write three words. And, um, and I, don't, I don't know where I came to starting to use form and to really to really pay attention, I shouldn't say to use because I certainly used it, but to pay attention to um, more more closely to form and using it to reinforce what I want to say or what I want. To, I, so I want it to look, don't write, con I haven't written any concrete poems probably since I was a little girl, but, um, but at the same time, I like the idea of the concrete poem is that I want what you see on the page to reinforce what's being said. So um, kind of like Sequoia talks about creating that, that white space to create breath and, um, and using that very constricted um, part of the text to show the ligature, to kind of reinforce this idea of the ligature. I, I think of my poems the same way, like where do I want breathing to happen? Um, where do I want the eye to go as, it's, as, as one is reading it on the page? So, um, so yeah, I, you know, I think of form as being a reinforcement of what I'm trying to say, and I don't necessarily come to form first. So if I think about the crown of sonnets, I didn't set out to write sonnets at all, much less a crown of sonnets. I, um, I always thought that was quite ambitious for a writer. Like, I was like, I'll never do that, but um, put myself in that. And as I started writing, they formed as sonnets. And I was like, I'm writing sonnets and I didn't even know it. And so, so then I started thinking about, we talk about the formal choices I was making specifically so that they did not look exactly like a sonnet. I realized that, well, that's when we talk about the grieving process and these are elegies and so forth, that, that the grieving process is not that formal. It's not going to appear that way. So what happens, because we're still in process, so we're still inside of the sonnet form, um, but that sonnet form doesn't look exactly like one might expect it to. Like it, 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 is, it does not follow that strict form. And I realized that that was part of me reinforcing, again, um, what these survivals of loss look like. And, um, and so I was making, specifically if I think about that, I was making those choices again to reinforce that idea um, without saying it over and over again, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, there's a couple of like sort of longer questions um, that <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, Vanessa, if you want to read your question, if you want to unmute and read your question, uh, feel free or I can read it for you. But if you feel comfortable, go ahead and unmute. No, I'm happy to do it. Um, let me just try to find it because it's a little bit further up. So what this actually is sort of perfectly synchronous to my day. I've been driving up to Muncie to teach high flex, yay. Um, and I was listening to NPR today and I was listening to a pianist talking about how for this whole period of quarantine, she has just felt like she lost, she wasn't practicing the way she does and she sort of felt like she lost her, she lost her voice a little bit. She lost um, her motivation to be an artist as a pianist. And so that it was specific to piano playing in many ways, but it was this, this artistic moment. And so I sort of generalized this saying that I, I have, I've heard this from a lot of people that artists are feeling really alienated from their crafts right now with COVID naturally with this climate catastrophe, especially depending on, on where we originate from. And then with the continued violence against BIPOC bodies. Um, and Sequoia, you really reminded me of this when you said, I'm trying out this new poem. It's been hard for me to write lately. And I, it just so resonated with what I'm hearing other people talk about in terms of 
what's weighing on them and what's keeping them from writing and keeping them from creating. And so that, like, that really, that really resonated with me in terms of what I'm hearing from my creative friends, what, what I'm feeling myself. Right. Um, and so my question is, you know, you sort of maybe intimated that you lost your voice for a bit or, or maybe it was just overwhelming and understandably so given everything that's happened, everything. It's just, it's, it's been a preponderance of <laughs> media mm -hmm. and just violence. Um, and so what I was wondering was how the poets, Sequoia, and Darlene in particular, but also our younger poets out there. I, I'm not calling you old, Darlene and Sequoia, sorry, I didn't mean to say that, but our, our former undergrads, right? <laughs> um, how you have been attempting to sort of survive this climate where so many people look to the arts to give us relief, entertainment answers. We're all like logging on to events like this, but also just other events where we're like, please show me a play, please show me these things. And how are you like, how are you dealing with this in terms of tapping into your creativity, in terms of um, writing poems, writing anything, creating anything right now when you're dealing with as much, if not more than the rest of us? I'm gonna say poorly. Um, <laughs> your, thank you so much for that. Um, observation and also really beautiful question. This period has been so difficult and I have been exhausted alongside other artists and creatives and it's for a lot of reasons. Um, one, I and my co-editors Darlene and Emily have been doing this elegy work for a, a, a long time now. So we're seven years into the movement for Black Lives and I think that there's a sort of collective exhaustion that many, particularly Black uh, women uh, are feeling in this moment who have done so much of the lifting work. And so actually for a large part of the summer, um, I said, I'm gonna step back. Um, one, I have to transition these classes online. That's crazy. Two, I'm going to move across the country to a new position to Atlanta. And three, these streets are crazy. We got police out here. I was in Austin, Texas at the time with tear gas, right? We have, um, especially in uh, where I was in Austin, Texas, this sort of neoliberal hub. And I noticed that particularly what had been a beautiful and blossoming movement was quickly becoming co-opted and b black bodies on the street um, were experiencing a particular danger at these demonstrations that hadn't quite been there before. There was a new tenor to the movement work. So all kinds of ex ex exhaustion, not to mention a global pandemic um, with an extraordinary number of um, um, people who have passed over. It's, it's an extraordinary amount of loss. The season of loss that we are living in is so protracted. Um, and yeah, so for me, I said, maybe the poetry, I'm not gonna beat myself up if the poetry is not coming now. I know that it will come. And something that's interesting, and I just it just has clicked for me about my own writing process, is that it takes me a long time to return to the, the occasion, to return to the event of the crime, the scene of the crime. I will write, you know, I'll write little phrases, I'll write in my journal, but the poem doesn't actually come until much time later. So the, the, the Trayvon, Martin came, Trayvon Martin poem came maybe six months after George Zimmerman's acquittal, right? Took me a long time to sit through the waves of grief that came with not only the murder, but also the trial and then the acquittal and then the aftermath of that, right? Same thing with the Sandra Bland poem. So I am sort of recognizing in myself at this time that if I'm gonna do my job as a poet, if I'm gonna record this moment, pay tribute, you know, archive it, uh, wrestle with it that I really have to kind of take care of myself and sometimes that care is just stepping back and knowing that the work will come 
if, if that makes sense, Darlene. And I think I'm finally at a point where I'm like, oh, dang, I wrote a poem. We're coming. <laughs> Maybe I am a poet, you know? <laughs> I, I haven't written through this pandemic. Um, I should say I haven't written any poetry during this pandemic. I have written a bit. Um, and, and when I say this pandemic, I actually should say these pandemics, right? Um, but in any case, no, I haven't, I haven't written in that in some ways is self-care. Um, it, I, yeah, um, because when I get in, involved in a poet, in a, in a poem or in a series or in thinking about these things, they become really heavy and I live with them. Like I live with the characters in my poems, I live with the poems and, um, and, and the other thing specific to my experience is that I'm extremely isolated. I have to, I'm immune compromised. I have, um, I have um, vulner, multiple vulnerabilities right now. So I'm, I'm really like, I, I'm not out in the public. So I'm not having a whole lot of engagement with human beings, which is kind of crazy. Um, but it, it lends itself also to this kind of um, thoughtfulness and getting inside your head. And when you stay inside your head, sometimes that can be a really dangerous place to be. So um, for me, what I have done instead, and I, I found this to be useful years ago when I was going through some other issues and, and couldn't seem to write or just uh, actually, I shouldn't say I couldn't write. I decided not to write because it was so painful, so difficult. I turned to visual art. And so um, what I've been doing right now is is kind of just doing a lot of visual art and not necessarily writing. And like Sequoia said, knowing that the words will come when, you know, when they, when they come. I remember um, particularly some of the poems in here are, are more recent, even though the events are fairly um, aged, you know, like San, the, the poem about the bees and Sandra Bland certainly didn't come at the same time. I, I'm sure that was years later, years. Um, because that's how long it took to deal with it. So, you know, I, for, for other artists who are wondering what they should do, um, or other poets who may be wondering what they should do right now, if the writing is not coming, I think I have faith and trust and know that it will come. Um, and also be mindful of, of, of taking care of yourself. I remember the poet Vibe Francis telling me, I was writing about um, Jonestown and the People's Temple, and she, um, she was reading my manuscript and, and I was in a workshop with her and stuff and she pulled me to the side and she said, this, that's a really dark thing to be writing about. And if you're, if you're staying with it all the time, because this is what we do as writers, we stay with our work, they stay with us. Um, grocery store, driving down the highway, they with us, right? Um, she was like, you, you have to come out sometimes. She said, it's just a dangerous place to be to stay there. And, and I want you to remember to always come out for air at some point. And I, I, I've taken that advice that was years ago, and I've taken that advice um, since then, that I, sometimes I have, to, I have to come up for air, you know, and right now is a time where I have to come up for air. I can't, I can't, I can't both, um, both live, if you will, like, you know, and, and also deal with everything that's going on on the page, and then have it happening at the same time, that would be that would be quite too much and overwhelming and I think dangerous. I think the big thing is that that becomes dangerous for any of us to stay inside of um, a dark space. I want to add, me and Am Emily have been uh, talking in the chat about, you know, it's interesting that she turned to fan fiction because poetry was not this thing um, just wouldn't come during quarantine is not coming d during quarantine. And I've been thinking how I turned elsewhere either. So I really needed to read the work of others. And I turned to essayists and other poets and I turned to visual art and documentaries and I have been consuming and I've been in a mode of consumption. And I'm thinking about how I'm downloading um, in a very targeted fashion for me. So I can't take just anything in at this moment. Um, but I am doing a sort of calculated, uh, massive download. And I think that there are times as poets, as artists, as creatives, when we take in and other times when we give out. And I have been really, really grateful for the poets who are able to give out at this time. Like, I, you know, the, 
like I mentioned, Elizabeth Alexander's essay, Jasmine Ward's essay that she um, published, which is heartbreaking mm -hmm. and beautiful, but something that was necessary that I needed to hear. Um, I think about Jericho Brown has produced some beautiful things during this mo moment. Books have come out. So Nikki Finney's new book, Love Child's Hotbed of Occasional Poems, beautiful. So much new work is out actually. So I'm just very, very grateful for the creators who are able to do it. And I know that there will be a point when they become exhausted too. And hopefully that is where we will step up, right? We'll have reserved our energies and um, continue the wave, continue the movement. I really love that. I just want to, I just want to say, I think that sort of plays along in terms of elegy and the grief cycle too, the way that everyone needs to step up at a different moment, right? And, and sort of carry on this legacy because you can't, you can't do it the whole time by yourself, right? And so like what you just said, Sequoia, makes complete sense to me. And thank you, Darlene, that was such a wonderful answer. Thanks for the question, Vanessa, and, and thanks for this conversation. I think um, this is a really, what we've kind of come to is seems really necessary and we're sort of, <laughs> you know, we're, we're kind of like in the eye of the storm right now, thinking about kind of where we are at this particular moment. And um, I, I kind of have two questions I want to close with, I want to get to. Um, one is just thinking about, you know, Sequoia, you, you mentioned the season of loss, and I know that's something that Brittany Kendrick um, repeated in, in the chat. And we are, you know, seven years in um, to the movement for Black Lives. And so uh, I, I think, you know, the conversation here tonight has is, is been, been about like that sometimes you need that distance to kind of even know where you are or, you know, what's coming or um, to, 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 to sort of be able to survey the landscape almost. Um, but I don't know if either of you have, a, have thoughts, anything else you want to share that you haven't yet about kind of where we are right now um, politically uh, in terms of, you know, the movement for Black Lives, Black Lives Matter, um, and, and I guess, you know, for the work we do, the relationship between art and that movement. Um, what's inspiring you? <laughs> um, you know, what, what, what concerns you? Yeah, just, I'll leave it at that. That's another big question, Emily. Darling, do you want to start? I have things to say. You know, that was a ridiculously big question. That's so weird. I'm sorry. I'm like, let me ask like 10 questions. Choose one. <laughs> I have been thinking about this a, a lot. Like, you know, where are we? Um, one of the things that I, I always go back to is that, is, is that we're, on a, we're in a continuum, right? So this is, while this moment seems to be the tipping point for right now, we've been at tipping points before. So, um, so I'm interested in the momentum that's been built. Like, so I live here, I live in Richmond, um, Virginia. And in Richmond, of course, Richmond has the Confederate history. Um, and they have the Confederate monuments. And with the George Floyd, uh, when, when, when everything erupted with George Floyd, they, they protested nightly for probably, I think, I know it was over 30 days at the monuments. They brought some monuments down physically, pulled them down um, before they could be pulled down. And, um, and the police, you know, escalated their, their own violence against these protesters and so forth. So the city itself has been, um, has been, has erupted in, in this time, right? And so I've been watching it kind of in real time, just in my, my very specific space. What's really interesting though, is that um, probably three miles away or where the mine, from where I live or where the monuments are, and like I, said before i'm kind of isolated i have to stay away from crowds and so forth for my my physical safety and health and so i wasn't at the protest or anything and over here you wouldn't think a protest happened but if you were watching the news certain news you would see that the city was burning only three miles away right and so when i think of this um this time here we are seven years in as a tipping point I remember going to the protest at the, near the same parks um, that, again, were, were 
have turned into these sites of um, reclamation, as they call them here. They've um, pa painted them. They've added basketball courts to the monuments. It's, it's, it's quite interesting to see. But um, I remember going to see uh, to a, a, a rally for Mike Brown. Right. And so that was how many years ago? You know, that was kind of the beginning of the movement. Hands up, don't shoot. And approximately seven years ago. And, and that was a tipping point. And yet here we are. Right. So where are we now? I'm not sure. Like, I, I feel like I've seen this before. I'm sure that there are some who are even who have been here longer than I who have probably who are probably saying the same things. I think we've been here before. We've been at this momentous point before. So now I'm interested in seeing what happens as a result of this momentum. And I'm hoping that this tipping point may tip us in that direction or, or further in the direction that we've been trying to go since for seven years and certainly before those seven years. Um, but to, to be honest, I, I don't have an answer about where we are. As in, I'm, I'm not sure. That's one of the questions that I'm asking myself. Where exactly are we? What I'm giving, I'm, what I'm doing now is just kind of providing context as to why I have those questions, where they're coming from. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where we are, other than to say that we're at a tipping point, and I'm not sure what that is going. What that even? I'm not sure what that's going to mean for sure. I'm not a prophet, but I'm also not sure what it literally means right now. I think that we're in a beautiful place and we're in a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful that this is the largest civil rights movement in the modern history of the world. Largest ever. Beautiful. Gorgeous. Most beautiful things are often the most dangerous. Yes, Emily. Um, I am thinking about how just a couple of days ago, 45 and his administration signaled out critical race studies as anti-American discourse, right? As something that falsely paints a portrait of America as racist and evil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm thinking how we are against a campaign of propaganda that is real, a campaign of disinformation. Um, that is very, very real and has material consequences. I am thinking about the white co-optation of this movement that is uh, led and created and co-founded by Black, queer, intergenerational, right, um, people, women. I, we are in a beautiful point where there is, as um, Darlene was saying, momentum and mass but I think that it's also a dangerous point. And I know just from, you know, my little bit of life experience that state repression is real, that consequences are real, that power doesn't give up easily. So I am hopeful and I am happy and I, and I like what I see, but I also know that waves of backlash are coming. They're here, they're gonna keep coming. And I hope that we are getting prepared. That's it, you know? Yep, absolutely. Um, I'd like to just close by thinking about our anthology, kind of bringing it back home to that. Um, and I know that, um, you know, this book, I think that it's done a lot of different things already. <laughs> um, it's really cool to see people that are in this book on the call tonight. Um, Angela Jackson Brown, Emily Scalzo, Debbie Mix. Um, there might be others that I'm missing that I can't see you. Um, but it's just, uh, it's just a beautiful thing, actually. So I feel like it's sort of the book is already building community um and getting in the hands of readers and other poets and activists and and writers of all kinds um so yeah i guess i'd just like to to hear from each of you if you have any thoughts about you know what you what you hope from this book moving forward or any kind of you know lasting or or sort of concluding thoughts about um about the tax, yeah. The only thing that I will say is that I am on a campaign to make sure that this book gets into every library in the United States. And then after that, I'm moving internationally. No matter where you are, if you're in Indiana, if you're from another school, wherever you are, 
please order this live or order this book through your local libraries and also through university libraries. I want to make sure that when there's another generation 100 years from now who are asking how did we get here and what are we doing that they come come back to this moment and know that we were doing the work that we were doing the writing and that we have been doing it and that we're part of a legacy and part of a continuum. So I want the, the book just to be accessible and available mm -hmm. for the people who are looking for it. That's it. And for the people who are not, who didn't know that's what they needed, right? Yeah. I don't, I don't have much to add. I just, yeah, I want to see it find its way to this, this canon of thought, you know, that's yeah. happening around this moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to say thank you so much to Arlene Anita Scott and Sequoia Maynard. Um, I really wish that we were in person so that I could hug you both, um, but I am sending all my love um, through the computer. <laughs> and also, I want to thank Caleb Bell and Brittany Kendrick for uh, introducing these poets tonight with your lovely work. That was amazing. I, that's like the one thing that's amazing about Zoom. <laughs> can bring each other together across great distances at no cost and and so that's that's a beautiful thing um thanks again to african-american studies i hope all of the students on the call at ball state if you are not already will consider becoming african-american studies minor so that you can be part of these conversations all the time um, and uh, thanks again to the honors college and the english department and just to all of you for coming right like I honestly can't see except four people right now. So I don't know how many people are on this call, but thanks to all of you for showing up tonight because um, this was a really important conversation and um, I'm honored to have been a part of it. So thanks everybody. Have a good night.